Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% are real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we begin, a note from our sponsor. I'm Richard Jacobs, Executive Director of the nonprofit Finding Genius Foundation and host of the Finding Genius Podcast. In late 2016, I was rear-ended at 65 miles an hour by a truck on the highway, which sent me off-road into a ditch. The impact of the collision gave me a concussion and other injuries. At the hospital, a CT scan showed that I had thyroid nodules, which turned out to be cancer. It was then, when I had a biopsy in my neck, that I realized, even if I was a millionaire, I wouldn't want a second or a third biopsy due to the pain and the invasiveness of it. And appointments at that time for thyroid experts were three to six months out. And I was worried about dying now, even if that was irrational. So because of this, I've decided to raise money to conduct a literature review on steroids, on the causes of anxiety and depression, a condition that affects well over 50 million people in the United States and hundreds of millions worldwide. Our goal is to create a codex, a guide that reveals all possible treatments for anxiety and depression for people that live with the condition or for loved ones that have it, as my wife and my son do. To find out more about our fundraiser, visit FindingGeniusFoundation.org and click on Current Initiatives. And now, to our guest. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Johan Hari. He's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, His new book is called Stolen Focus. Uh, His previous book that I read was called Lost Connections. Uh, Lost Connections was excellent. I mean, it was about our society and the anxieties we deal with and depression and medication and all that. I think it's a fantastic read. Now he's come out with Stolen Focus. Just full disclosure, I just got the audiobook last night, so I haven't listened yet, but I'm looking forward to it. But what I am looking forward to now is speaking with him. So Johan, thanks for coming. Hey, Richard. It's great to be with you. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about your background. How did you get into writing books and journalism itself? It was essentially the only thing I've been able to do. <laughs> so I didn't have that much choice. Right. I grew up in a suburb of London called Edgware. Uh, my dad was from Switzerland and my mother was from Scotland. And they met in London when my dad basically couldn't speak any English and my mother only spoke English. And they had what my mother calls a series of one night stands, which I tried to explain is not a concept that makes sense. If there's more than one of them, it's not a one night stand. And she got pregnant and they thought they had to get married. And really often she'll cry and say, he seemed so nice when I couldn't understand what he was saying, but it led to my existence. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. <laughs> I, you know, I grew up in a, my dad was a bus driver. My mother was a, a nurse and I, yeah, I just kind of, from when I was a small child, I loved to write. It was basically the only thing I could ever do. Mm. So as soon as I left university, I got a job on a British magazine called The New Statesman. And I've been writing ever since. I really like the depth of writing books in particular. With every book I ever write, there's a sort of, mystery that I want to understand. So with you mentioned lost connections. I wanted to understand mm. at that time I was 40 and nearly 40. And every year I'd been alive, depression and anxiety had increased. And I wanted to understand why. With my more recent book, Stolen Focus, I wanted to understand why our attention is collapsing and what we can do to get it back. So yeah, there's always for me, writing is always a way of trying to solve a mystery, you know? I mean, yeah, and so I get to try to explore those mysteries. Yeah, I can remember for listeners from Lost Connections, like you didn't just report on things. You seem to really go deep. And like you said, find out why this, why were you having a problem? Why do these other people have a problem, et cetera? So I really appreciate that about the book. And that's why I'm looking forward to the stolen focus. Yeah. Um, Thanks. You know, I don't want to spoil the book for myself or others, but (laughs) what are some of the things that didn't make it into the book? You know, let's start with maybe the research of it or the experiences you had. Like, what are some really, you know, shocking experiences you had around focus or lack thereof when you were writing the book? Well, I wrote the book because with each year that passed, I felt like things that require deep focus, like reading a book, things that are really important to me were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know what I mean? Like I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And I noticed this seemed to be happening to pretty much everyone around me. I was particularly worried about the young people in my life who so often seemed to be whirring at the speed of Snapchat when nothing's still or serious 
could touch them. And I put off researching this for a long time because I thought, well, doesn't every generation struggle with focus? But when I started to look at the evidence, it became clear to me that something different was happening. You know, for every one child who was identified with serious attention problems when I was seven, there's now a hundred children who are given who are identified with that problem. The average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. So I wanted to understand what's happening. So I ended up going on a big journey all over the world from Melbourne to Moscow to Miami. And I used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to interview over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention and really dig deeply wow. into their, their research. And what I learned from them is that there's scientific evidence for 12 factors that can make your attention better or can make it worse. And loads of the factors that can make your attention worse have been significantly rising in recent years. And we really are in a serious attention crisis. Professor Barbara Demony, who's one of the leading scientists in France, said to me that we can't, it's not possible to have a normal brain today. Professor Joel Nigg, who's one of the leading experts on children's attention problems, said that we need to ask if we're living in what he called an attentional pathogenic culture, one in which it's really hard for all of us to pay attention. And once you understand these big factors, it opens up a very different set of solutions because your attention didn't collapse. Your attention's been stolen from you by these big forces that we're all going to have to take on. Yeah, you know, what you may find interesting is I have a mentor and a, now a very good friend. Uh, he's blind. He was a professor at University of Adelaide. His name is David Olney. And I realized after speaking to him for a while, wow, your brain has been preserved. You have like a 1990s mm. brain while everyone else has been ruined because he can't scroll through Instagram or Snapchat or any of that stuff. And he has to mm. take in information in a... I don't know, I guess a more linear way, multitasking is harder. So I just thought it was very interesting. That's fascinating. And it was interesting to me because your instinct there was exactly my instinct at the start of this project, which is I actually thought tech would be the dominant element of the book. What surprised me was actually of all the 12 causes, although the way our tech is currently designed is a huge factor in devastating our attention. Actually, I don't think it's the biggest of the causes. I think what you'll see with your friend in Adelaide, and Adelaide's a great city. I actually interviewed some of the key people from my book there as well. Um, what you'll see, you'll see with your friend is, I would just say to anyone listening, think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of, whether it's starting a business, writing a screenplay, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, whatever it might be. That thing that you're proud of is something that required a lot of sustained focus and attention. And when attention and focus break down, as I think there's clear evidence they are, your ability to achieve your goals and your ability to solve your problems also begins to break down. And this is why I think losing attention is so disturbing because if it goes on long enough, you become a kind of stump of yourself. You can sense what you might have been, but you really feel like you can't actually get to where you should be. So it's a very distressing experience. And that's why it's so important for us to understand these 12 facts and to begin to challenge them. And I think there's two ways we've got to challenge them. I think of them as defense and offense. There's all sorts of things we've got to do as isolated individuals to protect ourselves and our families. But we've also got to go on offense against the forces that are doing this to us. Because the truth is, at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder over us all day. Mm. And then that person is leaning forward and saying, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. To which the response is, okay, I'll learn to meditate, but screw you, we need to stop you pouring itching powder over me, right? So we've got to deal with both sets of factors. And I go through in the book in very practical ways, the way we can do, ways we can do both. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit findinggeniuspodcast.com and click on support us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now, back to the show. Well, throughout researching and interviewing, you've interviewed a lot of people on it, which is great. Has your focus improved? Have you worked on yourself? And have you gotten better? Yes. I did a very drastic thing at the start of the research for the book. And it's not because I thought this would give me any kind of scientific evidence or anything. To be honest, it's just because I was so frazzled. 
Um, so I was in a lucky position. One of my previous books uh, was being made into a film. So I had a bit of money and I just decided, you know what? I'm tired of being wired. I'm just tired of feeling like this. So I booked a room in a beach house in a place called Provincetown in Cape Cod. And I announced to everyone that I was going away for three months and I would have no laptop that could get online and I would have no phone that could access the internet or no smartphone. And there were some ups and downs that I can talk about. But the thing that most blew my mind was how much my attention came back. You know, I was nearly 40. I thought maybe my brain's just deteriorated. I've gotten older. My attention was as good as it had been when I was 17. I could read books all day. I later realized there were actually a whole series of changes, not just the tech that had happened in Provincetown. I slept much better. I was much less stressed. My diet completely changed because there's no junk food in Provincetown. There isn't even a Burger King. There were all sorts of changes that happened. And I remember at the end of my three months in Provincetown, just thinking, well, I'm never going to go back to how I used to live. Why would I go back to that? And I got reunited with my phone across the water in Boston. My friend Shailene had looked after it and my laptop. And within about a month of getting my phone back, I never went back to being as bad as I was, but I went back to being about 80% as bad as I was. And I only really understood why when I went to Moscow and interviewed this fascinating person called Dr. James Williams, who had been one of the senior figures at Google. And he quit because he was so horrified by what they were doing to the world's attention. And he said to me, you know, the mistake you've made there is, although you had a great time, it's like thinking the solution to air pollution is for you personally to wear a gas mask, right? Mm. I'm not against gas masks. If I lived in Beijing, I'd wear a gas mask. But it's not the solution to the problem. The solution is to go to the source of the problem and deal with it there. So there are lots of things we can do as individuals and lots of changes that I've built into my life that I write about in the book and that I'm happy to talk about. And I would say they've improved my attention by about 20%, which is a lot. But I want to level with people in an environment that is constantly pouring acid on your attention. Individual changes are important. They can protect us and our kids, but they'll only get you so far. At some point, we have to take on the forces that are doing this to us. Yeah, I can verify for listeners. I try to get Johan for an interview and his publicist said, nope, can't do it until he's finished with his book. So <laughs> that's why I got him today. So it's true. He's not making it up. So, Johan, what was it like when you first went to Cape Cod? Were you like freaking out and FOMOing at first and you settled down after a while? Like, what was the experience like? The first week I felt almost stoned with like a kind of haze of decompression. It was just such a relief. I was so tired. I know it sounds odd to describe something as immaterial as the internet as heavy, but I felt like I'd left behind something really heavy. And then the next week, I felt my attention coming back, but it was in a sort of extractive, still quite in the mode of the internet. So I remember reading David Copperfield, the novel by Charles Dickens, and being like, okay, come on, I've got it. I've got it. He's an orphan. Get on with it. Come on, Dickens. You know, mm. and then I felt better. And then at the start of the third week, I had this terrible crash. I remember walking down the beach and everyone was just staring at their phones. No one was even looking at Provincetown. And I was just like, oh my God, you know, look around you. That's what I normally think when I see people in beautiful places, you're not looking around them, but looking at their phones. Mm. But in this case, I, instead of thinking that, I wanted to run up to them and snatch their phones and say, give it to me. I want it, mine. I will look at my social media because I felt this tremendous hunger. I'd had so many years of receiving all throughout the day, the thin, insistent rewards of the internet. And to suddenly be deprived of that, this is quite a pretentious way of putting it, but the French philosopher Simone de Beauvoir said that when she became an atheist, it was like the world had gone silent. And that's how it felt. It felt like the world had gone silent. No normal social interaction floods you with hearts and likes, right? And right, yeah. it was very disconcerting. And then I realized, oh, you've left behind this constant interruption and distraction. Now you're, you've created a vacuum that you're going to have to fill with meaning. And that was what I then kind of proceeded to do. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You know, like the room I'm in at home, there's piles and piles of books and papers and I remember 15, 20 years ago, there was so much stuff to read and look at. It was overwhelming. I don't know the words for it today, but it's like overwhelming times a billion. There's mm. so many podcasts, so many things, and so many books. It's just like, I feel like I'm shutting down and I'm, I'm freaking out. But it's, I noticed too, it's very hard for me to sit and read a book and it's hard for me to focus on things. My attention has been like chopped up into fragments and I want to get it back. I understand you're, you're so feeling. right. And one of the key factors, I really understood why I had felt so much better in Provincetown when later, just across the water, actually, in MIT, 
I interviewed one of the leading neuroscientists in the world, an amazing man named Professor Earl Miller. And he said to me, look, there's one thing about the human brain you need to understand more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is just a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years. It ain't going to change on any time scale you and me are going to see. You can only think about one thing at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen for a kind of mass delusion. The average teenager believes they can follow six or seven forms of media at the same time. So what happens when scientists get people into labs is they get them to try to do more than one thing at a time. And what they discovered is when you think you're doing more than one thing at a time, you're not, you're very rapidly switching between those things. You're juggling. So you're like, wait, what was that message on WhatsApp? Wait, what did Richard just ask me? Wait, what's this message on Facebook? What does it say on the TV screen over there? You're switching, switching, switching. And it turns out when you do that, what kicks in is something called the switch cost effect. There's an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence for. And the switch cost effect is when you try to do more than one thing at once, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll be less creative. You'll remember much less of what you do. And that feels like quite a small effect at first. In fact, when you look at the evidence, it's huge. If you receive eight text messages in an hour, you will perform 30% less in brain power than if you hadn't received those text messages. And there's one study that really drove this home for me. It's a, a really simple little study, very small, but it's backed up by a wider body of evidence. You know, Hewlett Packard, the printer company, they got in a scientist to do a little study um, with their workers. And what they did is they, he split their workers into two groups. And the first group was told, just get on with your work, whatever your work is, and you won't be interrupted. And the second group was told, get on with your work, uh, you're going to have to answer a heavy load of email and phone calls. So basically how most of us live. And at the end of it, this scientist gave an IQ test to both groups. And what he discovered is the group that had not been interrupted scored on average 10 IQ points higher, which to give you a sense of how big that effect is, if you or me sat down now, Richard, and we spoke to Big Spliff together and got stoned, our yeah. IQs would go down on average in the short term by five points. So being distracted is twice as bad for your IQ as being stoned. You'd be better off sitting at your desk, getting stoned and doing one thing at a time than you would sitting at your desk, not getting stoned and being constantly distracted. Now, to be clear, it's better to be neither stoned nor distracted if you want to focus. But this is a really big effect. If you're interrupted, it takes you, according to Professor Michael Posner at the University of Oregon and his research, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus that you had before you were interrupted. But many of us are never getting 23 minutes spare. We're constantly being interrupted or being interrupted a lot of the time. So we're constantly operating at this lower level of brain power. This is why Professor Miller said to me, the way he put it is we live in a perfect storm of cognitive degradation as a result of all this interruption. And there's two, with all of the 12 factors that are damaging our attention that I write about in Style and Focus, there are two ways we've got to deal with it. Like I say, there's defense, there's protecting ourselves. So I go lo lots of examples, but let's say with switching this, this problem, um, I just pointed across the room, but then realize you, obviously you can't see this and your listeners can't see it. In the corner of the room over there, I've got something called a K safe. A K safe is a plastic safe. You take off the lid, you put in your phone, you put on the lid and you turn the dial at the top and it will lock your phone away for anything between five minutes and a whole day. I use that phone. I use that, sorry, I use the K safe four hours a day. You know, I will not sit down with my partner to watch a TV series or a film unless we're both in prison. I'll have dinner with my friends unless we all lock our phones away. It's just a way. And it's difficult at first. It's really hard. But the pleasures of focus when they come back are so much greater than the pleasures of distraction. And yeah, and I can talk about some yeah. of the bigger solutions as well. I was going to say, I'm not trying to turn this into a therapy session or anything. I'm just trying to give <laughs> listeners my experience, which I think may resonate. I don't know if this is just because I'm getting older and stuff, but it just seems like the joys of any particular event have gone way down. You know, Halloween or Christmas or whatever it is, it's just not as exciting as it used to be. It seems like there's nothing in life. I'm not saying this because I'm depressed or bleak or anything, but nothing just seems as rich or as exciting as it did years ago. Well, I think there's lots of things that could be happening there. So one of them is, like I mentioned in Provincetown, when I realized I created that vacuum, where I was craving the signals of the internet, I started to think a lot about a form of body of science I'd actually learned about before. I investigated a lot, a lot more later after I left Provincetown, which is the science of flow state. So everyone listening will have experienced a flow state. A flow state is when you're doing something that's deeply meaningful to you and 
you just totally get into the zone and you're in it and your sense of time falls away, your sense of ego falls away, the way one rock climber put it, is you feel like you are the rock you're climbing. Different people get into flow states doing different things. It might be for you making bagels, it might be brain surgery, for me it would be writing. And flow states are a really important part of the pleasure of life. Also, even more importantly, they're an absolutely crucial element of human attention because um, flow states are the deepest form of attention humans can provide. And they're the form of attention which comes most easily. When you're in a flow state, it's not like an effort. It's a gusher of attention that exists in all of us. So I wanted to think about, okay, so how do we access this, right? So I went to go and interview a man named Professor Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, who's the man who discovered flow states in the 60s and researched them oh, for cool. like 50 years. You know about his work, don't you? Yeah, I know he recently, recently passed, but he was yeah, he, he's he like died, the godfather I, of flow. Exactly. I think I did the last interview he ever did. Wow. Um, he was a completely amazing man. and. He discovered many things about flow, but there were three things I think are particularly helpful for anyone listening who wants to know how to maximize their chances of getting into flow. There's no guarantee with these things, but you can increase your odds. And I think there's essentially three things. And I think this relates to your Halloween question. The first is, if you want to maximize your chance of getting into flow, try doing these three things. The first is you have to do just one thing. You have to let aside all your other goals and choose one thing that you're going to do. The second factor is it has to be a goal that's meaningful to you, right? So writing is meaningful for me. For some people, it might be painting a canvas. If I try and paint a canvas, it looks like a child has vomited on it. For some people, it might be rock climbing. If I try and climb a rock, I'll just fall off and die. Um, so it's got to be something that's meaningful to you. And thirdly, it hugely helps if it's something at the edge of your abilities, at the edge of your comfort zone. So let's say you're a rock climber. Um, you want to try to climb a rock that is slightly higher and harder than the last rock you climbed. You don't want to just clamber over your garden wall. That's not going to get you into flow. It's too easy. And you don't want to suddenly try to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It's going to be too much. You want one that's slightly more challenging than the last one. So if you do these three things, if you choose a single goal, if you choose a meaningful goal, and if you choose a goal that's at the edge of your abilities, you maximize your chance of getting into flow. But think back to what we were saying about switching, how we're constantly switching. You can see how that just smothers flow in its cradle, right? It just, if you're constantly being interrupted, you'll never get into flow. So I think that could be one factor. I mean, there's lots of reasons and lots of things we could explore, but that could be one factor why you're struggling to get into a state of, you know, feel like life has meaning and a sense of joy at the moment. Like you said, when you're watching a movie with your partner or eating, you lock your phones in a box. Has that increased your perception of the enjoyment of the experience? Do you feel like you enjoy stuff better now? Totally. But I want to be clear with people that these individual interventions are hugely valuable. I'm passionately in favor of them. Uh, they can improve your attention to a significant degree, but they're only the first step because we also need to take on the forces that are doing this. And there's a historical analogy that I think could help people to think about how we could do that. So you'll remember, Richard, I remember it. It used to be completely normal that people use leaded gasoline in their cars and they painted their homes with leaded paint. Mm -hmm. And it was known since the 1920s that lead, exposure to lead through petrol paint in the air really damages kids' abilities to focus and pay attention. But the lead industry funded a kind of denialist bullshit pseudoscience for a really long time to deny it. But by the 1970s, it was just undeniable that exposure to lead was really, really harming kids' brains. So what happened is a movement of ordinary moms, it was mostly mothers, banded together and said, why are we allowing this to happen? Why are we allowing this industry for profit to screw up our children's attention and focus? We're not going to allow this. And it's really important to notice what they didn't say. They didn't say, let's ban all petrol. They didn't say, let's ban all paint. They said, let's ban the lead in the paint and in the petrol. And in a similar way, there's a parallel with what's happening to us with tech. So I stress again, there are 12 factors that are damaging our attention. Tech is just one of them. But it's very specific, the element of tech that's harming us. There's an equivalent to the lead in the lead paint. You have to understand the business model for the current social media. And I spent a lot of time interviewing key figures in Silicon Valley who'd invented key aspects of the world in which we live and that obsess our kids. And the last quarter of the book is obviously about our kids and what this has done to them. And they explained to me, look, the current business model for social media is really simple. Every time you pick up your phone and they start to make money, every time you pick up the open Facebook or Snapchat or TikTok or whatever it is, they make money. The longer you scroll, the more money they make. It's very simple. Just like KFC wants you to eat fried chicken, um, these companies want you to scroll as much as you possibly can. 
And every time you stop scrolling, it's a financial disaster for them. So all of that engineering power, all of their algorithms are geared towards one thing, figuring out how do we get Richard to pick up his phone as often as possible and mm. scroll as long as possible. But it turns out social media doesn't have to work that way. So for example, I interviewed a guy called Aza Raskin who invented a key part of how the internet works. His dad, Jeff Raskin, invented the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. Aza said to me, look, the first step in solving this is very simple. You've got to ban the current business model. You've got to ban a business model that is based on figuring out how to hack your attention and sell it to advertisers. Just ban it. It's inhuman. It's like lead in paint. We shouldn't tolerate it. But I said to him and the other people who proposed this, okay, but what would happen the day after we did that? Would I open Facebook and it would say, sorry, guys, we've gone fishing. And he said, of course not. What would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. And everyone listening has exposed the different possible business models. So one is subscription. We all know how Netflix and HBO work. We'd pay a small amount and we'd have access to them. Another option, think about the sewage pipes. Before we had sewers, we had shit in the streets. We got had cholera. So we all paid to build the sewers and we all own the sewers together. You own the sewers in whatever city you live in. And it may be that like we want to own the sewage pipes together, that we want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention. Every mm. alternative business model we move to, the important thing to understand is that it completely changes the incentives for the social media companies. At the moment, all the incentives are to hack and invade your attention because you're not the customer. You're the product they sell to the real customer who's the advertisers. But if we change these incentives, if we move to a different business model, suddenly they, you're the customer. They have to figure out, what does Richard want? Oh, mm. Richard wants to be able to pay attention. Okay, let's design it to heal his attention, not to hack his attention. Oh, Richard wants to be able to meet up with his friends. Okay, let's design it to facilitate him actually meeting up with his friends and looking into their eyes face to face. But the key thing to understand is the social media companies will never do this of their own accord. Any right, more than yeah. the lead industry would one day have gone, you know what, guys? I think we've just made enough money. Let's just stop poisoning kids, right? That's not how it works, right? That will only happen, I argue in the book, yeah. that just like we needed and still need a feminist movement to reclaim women's bodies and their lives, I would argue we need an attention movement to, to reclaim our minds. And it requires a shift in consciousness. We are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back from the forces that have stolen them. And there are a broad range of focuses. You know, the factors causing this range from the food we eat to the sleep we don't get, from the hours we overwork to the air pollution we breathe in, which is causing brain inflammation. We've got to understand the causes of this attention crisis across the board. We've got to defend ourselves as individuals as much as possible, but we've also got to take on those forces. And I talk in very practical ways in the book about how we can do that. I'm really sorry, Richard, I'm actually feeling a little bit sick. Um, uh, could we do maybe okay. another five minutes? Is that okay? Is that going to be enough time or will that be long enough? No, no, that's fine. Yeah. One thing that flashed into my head as you were talking is, you know, what if someone has a restaurant and they say, you know, our new restaurant policy is you can't use your phone. When you come to eat here, you got to put it in this little lockbox or keep it away and then you can eat here. Otherwise you can't. What are your there are some like restaurants that? in Paris and other places that are doing that. And I think we've got to tackle this at all sorts of levels. So we've got to tackle it at an individual level and at a big governmental level, but there's intermediate institutions like restaurants. I think we need changes in social norms. Think again about that thing about how if you're interrupted, it takes you on average 23 minutes to get back to the level of focus you had before you were interrupted. So think about the expectation that we all have. If you've texted someone, they'll text you back straight away, right? Right. And I've had that feeling and you're sort of like, well, it only takes you a minute to check to, it takes you 20 seconds to read and reply. Well, to they one, expect you, you to as well. And if exactly. you don't, you feel guilt and all that. Exactly. And, but actually what we need to explain to people is you think it'll only take me 10 seconds to read and reply to your text, but it'll actually take me 10 seconds plus the 23 minutes it takes for me to get my focus back afterwards. So it's explained to people that we're draining. So there's, there's a whole level, there's governmental action, there's individual action, and then there's changing the social norms, not just around technology, but around the 11 other factors that are really damaging our attention as well. So I think you're absolutely right. So now that you've done this book, and regained your focus and then, you know, still kept about 20% extra of it. What are you noticing? What are your daily interactions with, you know, regular people that, you know, have no attention or like, you know, how has it changed how you're navigating the world and your relationships? I'm able to think much more deeply. I'm able to process things that have happened to me better. I'm able to anticipate the future better. I'm just more effective in the world when I can pay attention. 
you know? So I just feel more effective, like I have more agency over my own life. So yeah, it's been a really, really positive experience for me. Yeah, that's excellent. All right, so I know you got to go in a minute. Uh, last question or so. Uh, have you considered or, you know, like how important is this subject to you, research that, you know, would you, for instance, have you thought of making a course, taking these 12 steps in the book and, you know, helping people that want to pay for it to reclaim their focus or like what's I'm next not, for you now that you've done that? I'm a writer, but it's really underscored to me how important this subject is. Dr. James Williams, who's the leading expert on this, said to me, you know, imagine you're driving somewhere and someone throws a bucket of mud over your windshield. Mm. It doesn't matter what you've got to do when you get to your destination. The first thing you've got to do is get that mud off your windshield or you're not going to be able to go anywhere. And in a way, I think about the attention crisis like that. It doesn't matter what anyone listening wants to do. You want to start a business, you want to write a book, you want to look after your kids. If you can't pay attention all of those things are going to be so much harder. This is the foundational crisis, not just for individuals, but for a society, a society of people who can't pay attention. It's not just that our individual attention is collapsing, but our collective attention is collapsing. And that's why we're finding it, one of the reasons why we're finding it so hard to solve our problems together. So if we don't get attention right, we can't get anything else right. Attention is the daily texture of your everyday lived life. So this is crucial that we start getting this right absolutely believe the evidence shows we can get it right we can deal with these problems but we've got to understand the problem in a more complex way and we've got to fight we're going to have to fight for our attention as one politician said you don't get what you don't fight for got to, and of course i stress i mean peacefully fight for it but we're going to have to fight to get our attention back we're going to have to take on these forces and we absolutely can do that oh johan i think your book uh, may become one of the most important books that's needed by pretty much everyone now. So I encourage listeners very, very highly, based on my experience with Lost Connections and interviewing you, to uh, to get Stolen Focus. Oh. And I assume it's it's on you know Audible, Kindle, Amazon, all that stuff, right? Yeah, I meant to read a thing where I say you can get it on Audible, uh, audio, anywhere you get audio books. I'm also meant to say you can get it from all good bookstores, but you could actually get it from a shitty bookstore as well. And anyone who wants any more information about the book can go to stolenfocusbook.com where you can also okay. listen for free to audio of lots of the experts we've talked about, like Mihaly Csikszentmihalyi, the expert on flow, Earl Miller, the neuroscientist who's an expert on multitasking, just a whole array of people. So stolenfocusbook.com. I really enjoyed this conversation, Richard. Thanks so much. Yeah. Johan, thank you so much for coming. I oh, really appreciate it. Totally my pleasure. Have a good night. Cheers. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.